Yes, my name is Keith Kahn. Um, I'm a, a director and a designer, and I've been working in the cultural sector for about 30 years, I think. Okay. Were you born in the UK? Yeah, I was born, I'm one of the few Londoners that I know. I was born in Wimbledon, mm. and then left South West London and moved up North London and never been back. Okay. So, how did you begin your artistic journey? I began my artistic journey because I wanted to take over the world, <laughs> is really what I wanted to do. And I kind of, um, early projects, I really wanted to tr control everything. I think when you're young, you want to do that. So the early projects that I did involved costume and script and music and design very, very heavily. So one of the first pieces I did was a project for television, actually, for After Image. And it was like a performance art piece made especially for television with Jane Thornburn as the director. And it was a whole kind of painted scenario with these characters moving in and out of it. And all the characters were carnival characters. And then they moved through. And I wanted to make it look like, like uh, Persian miniature paintings. So you couldn't tell where the floor was or where the ceiling was or everything like that. So I started that um, and I... Yeah, I think that's where I started. Mm. Did you study fine art? I studied sculpture. Mm. I studied at Middlesex University at the time. And um, while I was there, I was lucky enough because almost straight away, I was designing st studio sets for television programmes and selling clothes in Camden, Camden Market, no, Kensington Market back then to make money. Mm. And how do you find that your studies impacted later upon your work? What's the relationship between the two? My tutor probably is the relationship because he was great. His name was Dante Leonelli and he encouraged me. We were in very, very early computing days. So in fact, I was in the 4D department, which was concerned with time. And previous students of his had been um, Anish Kapoor and also Julian Maynard Smith from Station House Opera. So I think he had this interest in kind of time-based stuff and um, was a real uh, catalyst to pushing me into doing interesting stuff and creative stuff. He was great. He was North American and kind of crazy. So yeah, so he was very, very good. Mm, yeah. And a bit more about your personal relationship um, with your art studies and later on with your career. Um, what's your experience? How did your family and your friends react to you studying this particularly? I think they were fine. I mean, I think I went to, I, I uh, applied and got into the Courtauld um, School of Art initially. And then when I realised it was non-vocational, I found a course that was vocational. And I went for a sculpture course because it was multidimensional and I wasn't stuck to painting or printmaking or anything like that. And a lot of the work I did was very architectural. So the way I used the course was learning skills. So everything from woodwork to welding. So I got a lot of practical skills out of it, which I took full advantage of. Mm, so your family supported you going into Yeah, that? I think they were medium supportive, yeah, I would yeah. say. Could you tell us a little bit more about your family's background? Yeah, my, my mum and dad came on a boat from Trinidad to the UK in the 50s. So I think that's quite a big journey to make. Mm. Um, and quite profound, really, to, to be travelling all the way from Trinidad via Venezuela and Spain and all these places. And, um, yeah, and I, I, they came here for, the, for education, really, and for opportunity. So, yes, and I have a very strong emotional link to Trinidad and, the, and its carnival and its culture and, and the family that's there. Mm. So, so you have the feeling that having an international background, having a transnational background, it, it has an impact upon your artistic identity? Yeah, I mean, especially Trinidad, because, I mean, I know that North America used Trinidad back in, I think, in the 80s to study the impact of HIV, mm -hmm. because they recognised that Trinidad was very much what cities of the future would become, because it has the whole diversity of people, it has the whole diversity of the mixing of people that you see in contemporary cities like New York, Toronto or London these days. So 
I was lucky to come from a culture where kind of integration and mixing was very much part of the norm. And I think that gave me a huge edge in terms of how I viewed living in London and being in London. Mm. Could you tell us how you brought that into some of your earlier work projects? Yeah, a lot of the early projects were very carnival-based and very Trinidadian. Um, one of the main things I've taken in all the early projects was an open making system, a mass camp in the carnival terms, which is where people come together to make things, anyone. So you'll get, you know, old guys drinking rum in the corner and nurses sewing, you know, a billion costumes on the other part of the room. So I applied a lot of the, I suppose, cultural making systems associated with carnival to the early projects. So even if I wasn't making carnival, I may have had the mass camp or the, the community bit of it there. So yeah, and then also the cultural form. I mean, carnival is unbeatable in terms of its creativity. I wrote my thesis at art school about a guy called Peter Minchel, who's an amazing carnival creator in the, from the Caribbean. Mm. Yeah. So your work seems to have a lot to do with, with collaboration and, and also transnational concepts. How do you feel about a term such as British South Asian theatre, which is a way that I think some of your projects have, have been described in those terms? What's your opinion on, on that as a concept and as a term? I think it's a term that will have its time, <laughs> and I think it was had, it's had its time and had its place. Um, I think at one point we were termed black. Mm. At one term we were sort of diversified into, you know, different types of ethnicities. I think in this day and age I find it slightly more problematic to be so pigeonholed in that way because my aim for every single project I've made has always been to make it for a wide, as wide an audience as possible. I recognise that there are some interests of the South Asian community that if you're making projects to bring them in you have to you know allow but actually I would much rather the work was transcendentary mm. rather than limited by the title and I, I think it's a funding term rather than an audience term I don't think it I don't think audiences care um, I, I think it I think funders care and you know in that sense yeah, yeah. on this question of audience um particularly in your earlier projects, who was your target audience? Well, I think with Flying Costumes, it's a very good question because when I did Flying Costumes, I assumed everyone would turn up and they didn't. <laughs> and I was very aware of the fact that it was limited to ultimately a kind of, in the day, a Guardian reader ship type audience. It was quite limited. It was, it was white, middle class. And immediately after that, that's when I approached Theatre Royal Stratford East with a big Bollywood show, because I was like, well, it would be very interesting to try and get people of different ethnic backgrounds into your building. So it was an audit. So actually, the work was guided more by my desire to broaden the audience base. So in effect, I think that was '91. You know, uh, Moti Roti Putli Chuni was the name of the show, and it was the first Bollywood show on stage and the strategy there was to was to appeal to an Asian specifically an Asian audience with that piece only because I was aware that they were absent I mean in audience terms with carnival I was aware that there was a captive audience at carnival time that was uh, Caribbean be that black African African Caribbean or Indo-Caribbean mm -hmm. there's definitely an audience with the theatre stuff there was a definitely a kind of white catchment area and I seemed to find that there was a kind of bit that was missing. So as I've progressed, I've been interested in how you develop that audience. But these days, I think it's very different. I'm sure you'll get to that. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that that was received as well at the time? And can you say that that's changed as well over time? Yeah, the show was a huge hit, partly because we cast this guy called Nitish Bharadvaj, who were, he had played Krishna in the Mahabharat, which was the... I think it had the highest viewers in the world at the time. So it was produced in India. I think it had, you know, like a ridiculous number because it was, he played Krishna. And he was in London and I made contact with him and he was the lead actor and he was playing a villain. So we had, you know, it was a great marketing stroke in order to, to bring people in. And they did come in and they were all intri intrigued by the show because the show was 
from the background is much more multimedia, much more visual, had projections and dance and all sorts of things. So, yeah, that, yeah that's how it kind of evolved. Yeah. And some of those concepts that you developed back then, do you find that you've taken them over with time in your later works as well? Can you talk a bit about your, your projects afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, you know, that, and sadly that's the start of celebrity culture, isn't it? It was the start of just trying to find somebody of famous to pull audience in, um, regardless of if they had the skills or didn't have the skills. So, um, yeah, I feel sorry that... Uh, <laughs> that sorry. No, you know, it was a great show. Um, and I think my drive has always been to try and widen the audience that attends stuff. I think the challenge these days is not so much an arts-going audience, but actually a wider audience who engages with popular culture. Because I think the arts are limited because they're kind of snobbish. And I'm aware that there are so many things that people engage with that sit out, allegedly sit outside the arts, but are cultural. So think phenomena like the Harlem Shake or any of these online social media activities, I think are, cult are culturally valid, but I think they're dismissed by, uh, by a lot of the cultural sector because they're, they're seen as low grade. So I'm very interested now in trying to find ways that you can tie together my interest in developing audience with technology and how people can engage. So maybe it's not all happening in live spaces, but there are interesting ways. And it's not just about websites, it's actually a way that people actively engage with work as opposed to sort of passively receive work. So I think the big change that I've made is that um, the early projects regarded the audience as a passive receiver of projects, which was sort of visually beautiful. And I think these days I'm interested in how you make that an active relationship. Yeah. You know, I'm still working on it and I would still like to develop that. And on the other hand, I'm also developing back into doing stuff that's more visually and design orientated because I think the stuff that people can't do online is stuff that's amazing looking. I think that's where, my expertise, where I'm hoping to focus my expertise on. Yeah. Could you maybe tell us some concrete examples of, of projects where you've applied this? Well, I think the best, that, well, there's several examples actually. I did two big shows on the South Bank Centre for Academy, which all featured the architecture of the building. So they were all very, very well sighted into the beautiful architecture of the South Bank Centre. And there were projections on the building. The music kind of wrapped the whole space and everything like that. So they were very, very easy to access. The content of the shows was South Asian dance, mm -hmm. which, you know, I wasn't in, I mean, I am interested, but I wasn't interested in the precision of what the different forms were, be it like Bharatanatyam or... Odyssey or Kathak or any of these things, I was interested in how you make a big broad sweep and capture lots and lots of different things. So that was great because they were in the public realm, they were free, they were outdoors, but they were also sophisticated. I think a lot of stuff produced these days are, is kind of very much kind of crowd fodder and they seem to lose the quality that I think you know, good art sometimes has. And then the other piece that comes to mind where I think those have come together was very, very different, which was a project called Aladdin, which was a collaboration with uh, Marianne Weems from the Builders Association in New York. I saw her show called Jetlag, which was amazing, and it was the first time I'd seen technology on stage so well integrated. And I thought she was a pioneer in that, and I must meet her and we must work together. So we did, and her interest gravitated towards the call centres in Bangalore. And what was great is that um, we were able to ho hone in on a cultural phenomena, which is the back office that is India, with all the call centre operators being used as the sort of back room of, um, of culture. And we filmed them and we spoke to them and they were all integrated into the show as well. And the show toured for two and a half years mainly in North America, and was just a huge hit because it was on the zeitgeist of kind of, of, of culture. And that really, really interests me at the moment. Mm. So a lot of your projects have, have travelled as well. You've done them in, in other countries. Yes, yeah. a lot. Uh, how, how does that impact upon your work? 
I think you start thinking about an international audience and you, and you stop thinking in a sort of parochial way about a UK audience. I mean, to some extent, the UK tour of Aladdin was successful, but it was so... All the marketing drive was on Asian community. But actually, in North America, it was about job losses and are we going to lose our jobs to these Indians? Mm -hmm. So the sell was entirely different and that's why it was a success. Right. So you bring it into this country and it's kind of focused back down on, you know, and it's not Bollywood, so, you know, it was kind of interesting. But international audiences are interesting because, they, you know, I was lucky enough as head of culture with the Olympics to visit Beijing during the Olympic year and, and just really begin to understand this another view of how culture can be received and understood. And I've been doing a lot of stuff in India and the dynamic is very, very different because these are new economies and they've only existed maybe in the past, you know, 10 to 15 years in terms of a great middle class. So how do you make work for that? Their tastes are different, the way they receive things are different, their interests are different. Um, so I'm interested because, yeah, it's, it's new and I think it's very exciting. Mm. So in terms of these differences between audiences abroad and audiences here, is there, is there a certain way that you think you can describe or characterize the theatre scene in Britain today? Or the performance scene? Not, not easily. I, I suppose um, it's become a lot more mainstream. I think there's a lot less experimentation than, than there used to be. I think there was real opportunity with um, younger artists and crazy artists and a lot more kind of performance stuff that you don't see anymore. And I really think that's a shame. I mean, there's a great organisation called LADA, which is the um, development agency for live art, the live art yeah. with um, uh, the whole team there. And they do a brilliant job in terms of nurturing that, but I, less of it surfaces into the, into the mainstream venues. I think venues control a lot more about what, they, what products they're making. So last year I did a show with Sadler's Wells, which was a Bollywood musical, but it was very kind of producer-led. So it's very different from the piece in 91 that we made because the whole atmosphere was different because it was about, you know, ticking their box. It wasn't driven from the artist. So it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting phenomenon, I think, in terms of what's happening theatrically. You know, and I think that there is a lot of commercial stuff that's going on that's really quite, quite innovative and less stuff going on actually in the subsidised sector. I mean, certainly in the Asian sector, I think it's kind of moribund, if not entirely dead, actually, because I, I can't see anything intelligent, really, going on. So that's awful, but I, yeah, I, I don't feel it in the way that I could feel it before. Mm. So you feel it's a, it's a constricting label in that sense as well? Yeah, I think it's a... Yeah, I do. I do think it's a constricting label. Yeah. Yeah, I can't deny it. <laughs> yeah. Could, I don't think it's a constricting label. I think it's a constricting policy. I think that the way it's approached it hasn't been refreshed. And um, I think that unless the Britain identifies itself with these developing economies, then it could reinvigorate itself. But the expertise that's here in terms of theatre could easily be working directly with India or with the Caribbean and all of the stuff that's going on there, but it doesn't. It stays kind of touring in itself. And I think to re-enliven it, I think you've got to make these international and very intelligent links with, with new communities. Um, do you bring that into your, into your current and your future projects? I'm trying to. <laughs> Can you elaborate <laughs> a bit? Well, I mean, I'm... I'm developing stuff at the moment that's basically pure design and, um, and I'm developing stuff with India. Uh, in a way, that's largely to refresh myself because I think that there's a, there's a completely different... Mumbai is an amazing city and people have an energy there and are very thoughtful and will go get things. It was much like here in the 80s. Um, that's what you sense from India and it's it's, you know, they're kind of jumping hurdles in terms of creative thinking and in terms of trying to pull together opportunity. You know, these are countries that don't have subsidy. So the way they approach things is very, very different in terms of how they put things together. Mm. When you say that's how it was here in the 80s, you mean more in terms of the resources that the artists <coughs> are working with? And also the exchange, because I think the resources were here, but there was a very dynamic exchange between 
the UK and the rest of the world. So, I mean, we were doing stuff internationally, and we were doing stuff in Canada and Pakistan back then. There were people like Talvin Singh, um, there was the Blue Note, there was a lot of exchange into actually mainstream, and focusing here on India, but I think it goes in lots of other different areas and different countries. There was like an exchange, a creative exchange, as well as a physical exchange. That's not so common these days. Mm. And were these the projects that you did with Moti Roti, actually? When you say we here? We, no, it's not just with Moti Roti. I'm talking outside of Moti Roti, actually, mm. with this one, because I'm thinking about all the other um, Asian artists who were doing stuff there, visual art, performance, music, film, actually. Yeah, I see. And do you have, um, in terms of your future projects, you spoke now of, of the collaboration or the work that you're going to be doing in India. Do you have any other projects in mind as well? That I've been trying to develop stuff with the Caribbean yeah. for a very, very long time. Uh, that's been challenging because, again, there's very little money there. There's very, very little money there. Mm. Um, and I'm really looking to think of different ways that people can create things. So that I'm having a scale shift because I think for things to work, they have to work on a very micro level, on a kind of one-to-one -one basis. So some of the stuff, I've just been artist in residence at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And my interest there is trying to create projects that, that are very generous in terms of how you get involved and try and create stuff that is based on kind of infographics, because the stuff that interests me is visual. So I'm interested in creating shows that are about these future economies, especially India and China, well, the BRIC countries and Brazil, you know, and I'm interested in how can you make economics and statistics, because that's actually what people are interested in from these, from these backgrounds. They're not interested necessarily. I think if you frame them in a good story, that would be great. And then horror. Those are the other, th the other thing that I'm really interested horror. in. Horror. Yeah. Could you explain a bit more? I think horror is a good, I mean, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I've been, the things that I'm developing in my mind are to do with, with, with horror, actually, <laughs> because um, th there's so many gory films <laughs> out there and gory stories, but actually something with a kind of mystical cultural bias mm. hasn't really been done very effectively. Mm. It's always satanic, but it could equally well be about Kali or other things. Mm. Um, and be a scary, in much way there's like a renaissance in um, Korean films and Japanese films with those great films like The Grudge and all of those films I think are amazing because they're typically, well those ones are typically Japanese but they speak to a universal audience. So I'm interested in that and both the Caribbean and India are so ripe with an Africa with folklore and stories but I think they could be contemporized in a really nice way and not, you know, so yes, so that's where I'm at to some extent, yeah. Yeah, that brings us back to, to what we said earlier about these, in, these transnational, international concepts yes. that are understandable to different types of audiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Horror is a very universal one, isn't it? Yeah, what scares people? It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah. Horror and economics, I don't think that's necessarily a, a great portfolio bracket, but it is where my mind is. And children, I'm really interested, I'm really interested in like people under five. I think that's a really interesting area where people are still kind of formulating their minds. But I, I do think the way I'm going to make projects is going to be different mm. because I think that I, I really want to engage with new technology in, in a very active way, both in the creation of the project and also potentially in the delivery of it. Mm -hmm. So hopefully with the v &A, um, these will be like w webcasts, live casts. So I'm not just bound to what happens within the, the space, but the project can have a longevity because it's been built into the web. Mm, it becomes like a, like a living project yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I, do think that's what it, I do think that's what I'm aiming at, is projects that are alive, yeah. yeah. Um, in general, um, how do you envision the future of such projects continuing, um, not just for you, but, but also for the other artists or the <coughs> artists that you work with? In an ideal world, would you like there to be more opportunities for people to work like this? Do you think that there are currently enough opportunities for people to work like that? No, I really don't think there are enough opportunities for people to work like this at all. I think, you know, it's a fascinating time. I mean, if you think 
all of those things didn't even exist. Twitter, Facebook, um, I mean, there's so many social media things. They didn't exist seven years ago. They were not even, not even in our thinking. So the speed of which we're moving is super fast. So I don't, I mean, the cultural sector is light years away, really a long time back in terms of where it's at creatively. So I think we're in this, and, and I think the music industry is very different. I think the film industry is very different. So I think we're all just figuring it out. But the nature of where these projects can go has a lot more potential. And I think they all have to be cross-platform um, and they all have to be... So I think it's going to emerge because I think all of these big industries are trying to fathom how they, how they can make product or make the money, mm. ultimately. But it is going to be a, a couple of years of, of artists figuring it out as well as the technology going alongside it. Yeah, it's an exciting time. But very challenging, and there's really not money around for this, unless you're commercial. What are the biggest challenges for you working in such an environment? Lack of money. Lack of money. <laughs> I think is a is a very very big one. I mean, um, I don't have any funding vehicles anymore. I mean, I left Mercury, went on to the to Rich Mix and to the Olympics. Um, one as chief exec and one as a kind of head of a department. And um, I think moving back into being a real artist as opposed to a bureaucrat has been a challenge mm. because I'm, be I'm still trying to pull together my newer economy but because I'm interested in new things that's also a challenge. Mm. I always like to, you know, risk is, risk is good. Mm. <laughs> Speaking of risk, which of all of your projects do you feel that you've taken the greatest risk in or that's been the most, um, shall we say, the most outgoing in your opinion? Well, there's several. I mean, I think uh, uh, one project I really took a risk with was a project called Ma, that was really a roadkill on stage. Frankly, it was really, it was really, <laughs> it really wasn't. It, it, we did it. We it was ambitious. It was hugely ambitious. It had every drag Asian drag queen in London. Not everyone, because many of them didn't want to appear in it. But it had Asian drag queens in London in the um, uh, in the show, and it had carnival, and it had just anything just pulled in um, so it was a vessel for kind of theatrical madness that I would love to do that and we rehearsed it in two weeks which is really far too short so that was a super risky and super crazy show but actually was a lot of fun and then Wigs of Wonderment is a show that was all about black hair and was kind of site specific and was the first time I'd done stuff that was like a one-to-one -one show with talking about issues, well it was ultimately to do with black hair, but a lot of it became about gender issues, about men, about how they feel about women, so, because all the performers were women, well, women and drag queens, mm -hmm. um, throughout the whole, and you met them all on a one-to-one -one basis. So that was a really exciting um, thing. And then the early projects, like Flying Costumes, Floating Tombs, was super risky, because it was just a case of trying to pull energy together. And I kind of miss that. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you say that you feel that some of these projects were risky, do you also get that sense from the way in which they were received as well? Ma, for example, how was that received at the time? Yeah, it was. Um, I think it was described as a turkey. <laughs> <laughs> On in some paper, well, no, it was, it, it was. Some people really. There was one or two people that actually really liked it, but um, yeah it wasn't well received because it didn't fit the norm of theatre. You know, it was much more between performance art and theatre. Okay. So, so at that time, I think now it would be received differently mm. because I think there are people here that would get it and there are audiences that would get it. And I probably wouldn't do it in the same way anyway. So, yeah. How would you do it if you did it now? I, I don't know. I'd do it more like, a, a more, exper more experientially. So the audience are much more engaged with it rather than sitting necessarily back in a theatre. Mm. Yeah. And I'd use probably more te use more technology. A, yeah. yeah, you use live collaboration and <coughs> interaction in a lot of your works. Why is that important for you? Because it's a it's a definite engagement. It's a real engagement. It's that's yeah. It's as simple as that. You you can change it, and if you're bored, you can switch it off, as it were. And I think that you know, it's not indulgent. It keeps you nimble because you you know 
the, the wait time, the dwell time on any website or anyone is very, very limited because mm. there's so much out there that you can engage with. So, yeah, brevity is... Um, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that does define the things I would do now, they'd all be shorter. Mm. I mean, with Aladdin, both Maria and I were very clear that it could never be more than an hour long. And I think even that now, people just don't have the attention span. Unless you do something that's entirely time-based, which I would also be interested in, and maybe last like four days. Mm -hmm. But actually, in terms of shows or in terms of performances, I think they have to be quite short quite these short. days. Yeah. yeah. Um, so from all these elements that we've talked about today, um, such as the international influences, such as collaborative work, work also being taken abroad, in light of all of that, which one for you personally is the most memorable and the most, not to say successful, but, but maybe in a way for you personally, which was the best one? The best one? I don't know. There can be the several. There, there are, well, yeah. I don't think I have a best one because the thing is, I suppose I've taken so many different risks over time that I've never really settled into one thing. So I can't say, I mean, the, the Millennium Dome, the show, was great because in a way it was kind of marking the end of a lot of those things I had done in the 90s and, well, in the 90s and 80s. And it was a great way to kind of round that stuff all up and, you know, kind of do great costume and do big costumes. So that was a good kind of full stop at that point. So I suppose I'm now looking for a, another full stop, maybe in 2020 mm. or something like that. <laughs> okay. I think you're done, aren't you? Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? No, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you about this. I hope, um, I hope yeah. <laughs>